quite cathartic for me. Um, I don't know if any of you know this. Can I go, what are you thinking of it, Paul? I'm very ill-equipped. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, talk about yourselves. Anyway, where was I? Yeah, I don't know if any of you know this. I have one or two friends here, so you might know this. But I am actually, a properly, fuck off you freak and stop annoying me, diagnosed manic depressive. It's actually true, I am a manic depressive. And, um, I've forgotten the next bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really, basically, I'm a manic depressive. But my dad, who is northern, obviously, basically he just thinks I'm a really miserable bastard. My little brother as well, my little brother's depressive as well. Um, he's actually a bit of a mentalist. That's not like we're allowed to use the term mentalist. Apparently it's a proper medical term, I've been told. Um, actually, speaking of mentalist, has anybody watched that programme on, on a Thursday night, that uh, cop show, The Mentalist? It's on Channel 5, so hardly anybody will have seen it. But I really fucking love that programme. She's on me again, I don't believe it. Um, I really love that programme, and I was talking to Chris about it the other day, and I said to Chris, I said, um, Chris, I fucking love The Mentalist. And he looked at me and he went, I thought you and Cassie had split up. <laughs> Which, to be fair, was, you know, a little bit harsh. I don't know if you know anywhere, there's this, there's this brilliant statistic that says that um, one in four people apparently suffer from mental illness. I'm very proud because that's the one area that my family is above average. <laughs> I was quite disappointed though when I went to the doctors because um, I went to the doctors and I wanted to have one of these really sexy depressions. I wanted to have like, I wanted to have sex addiction. That would have been the thing to get. Sex addiction, yes, come on. Imagine that, sex addiction. And celibate. That's a frustrating combination. <laughs> but basically, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to have a really sexy diagnosis and basically I got a shit one. Basically I got told, Mark, you're a manic depressive. That's bollocks. If I'd have been OCD, I would have had the world's tidiest flat. If I'd have been schizophrenic, I would finally have had somebody to talk to about how fucking miserable I am. <laughs> no, it's true, I am, I am quite a miserable person. Um, when I got diagnosed, and it's alright because um, uh, you are quite safe because I am now having medical treatment for my condition. Uh, I would advise them not heckling me because I haven't taken my medication today. <laughs> But anyway, yes, yeah, so I have been I have been diagnosed and I've um, I've been on suicide watch. It's quite sad, isn't it, really? But I've been on suicide watch. I was so disappointed. Bill Oddy, that blonde girl, they were not outside my flat. No film crew, nothing. I did, however, get a daily phone call from the Surbiton Mental Health Team. Now, Surbiton's quite posh, isn't it? I don't suppose they get many mad people in Surbiton, so they were always quite friendly and they used to ring me up on a daily basis. And um, there was a couple of times when I thought, I could really fuck these people over. I had this brilliant idea of, like, when they rang me one time, standing on the phone and going, can't talk, I'm holding up a school at gunpoint. <laughs> But the reality was that all I actually ever did, being a man, all I ever did was just go, yeah, I'm fine. Thanks. Bye. The thing about being a man is that you just know, however depressed you are, however sad you are, however much you're reaching out to your friends, you will just go, yeah, I'm fine. That's just the downside of being a man, I think. So there came a time when I thought, well, actually, I'm not going to bother answering the phone. I'm, I'm all right. I'm feeling great about myself. I'm not going to answer the phone. Then I had this vision of the SAS Samaritans crashing through my living room window, fucking huge box of Kleenex wanting to give me a hug. So I thought, I'm not really bothering with that. I do. Oh, give me a drink again. Sorry, this is very amateur. Aren't the fucking older people drink that normally? Um... But now, I'm a bit more sorted out, and um, I go to a hypnotherapist now. <laughs> Hypnotherapy is so disappointing. I wanted a bloke who wore a long cape, had a big pointy beard, and went like that with a watch. <laughs> you are getting sleepy. I wanted all that shit. Now, just a bloke going, think about these things, Mark. What's quite weird, though, is if any, if any of you say the word egg, 
I immediately start acting like a chicken. <laughs> that is a comedic conceit. It's not actually true. Neither is my middle name Oedipus, nor have I shagged my mother. Chris, I've shagged yours, though. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I have. And she was great, frankly. Because <laughs> she was when I finished with her. Um, <laughs> the other thing, right, about being, about being depressed is um, how crap... <laughs> Shut up! How crap the English are, thank you. How crap the English are with things like depression. I mean, I play football with a group of lads and I've got lots of friends at work and... Um, well, I've got people at work with me. I haven't got that many friends at work. And, oh, it's a bit fucking late for this soup to be about now, isn't it? Um, but the best you're ever going to get from an English man when you say, I'm depressed, the best you're going to get is somebody going on your shoulder going, yeah, cheer up, mate, it'll be fine. Or they'll totally... Yeah, thank you. Or they totally, totally avoid you. The other weird thing about being English and depressed, right? It's one of these um, cross-cultural things. There's a really big difference between being English and depressed and American and depressed. When you're English, for instance, I'm an English man and I suffer from depression. That means a few things. I listen to the Smiths a lot. I write really, really bad poetry. Yeah. And I go on Facebook and I moan on my status. That's English and depressed for you, yeah? If I was American, I'd have a long leather coat, side parted, centre parted hair, a big beard, an AK-47, and enough ammunition to take out a lecture theatre. <laughs> now think about it, which would you rather face? A bloke with gladioli stuck up his arse reading poetry to you, or a man that looks like Marilyn Manson with a fucking big gun and a camcorder? So, I'd think about that. The other thing about Americans is that in America, depression is much more mainstream. Uh, in America, for instance, you know the company Pfizer that make Prozac? They, um, they sponsor NASCAR racing. And NASCAR racing is basically Americans racing running in a big fucking circle all day, endlessly. And the one thing is, is that I get up in the morning and I take my um, Prozac or, you know, other, other antidepressants are obviously available, but I, um, I take my Prozac in the morning and I'm made to feel that a little bit better. Not by the drug itself, but by the fact that some fucking redneck is just a few more miles nearer to his impending death. <laughs> <sighs> there is actually quite a lot of depression in sport, thinking about it, though. Um, I don't know, you lot certainly don't, but I don't know how many of you, uh, how many of you follow football, but... Um, Tim Howard, who is the um, Everton goalkeeper, so it's a very niche market there, he suffers from Tourette's. Which makes training interesting, I'm sure. But to be fair, I also suffer from a very selective form of Tourette's. If anybody says the name Cassie, I start swearing like a fucker. <laughs> also, I don't know if that is a less famous goalkeeper, but I have to tell you something. There's a less famous goalkeeper called Andy Gorham, who, um, who was very, very brave as a professional footballer. Professional footballers hate anything that's different. I remember that Pat Nevin got slagged off for being gay because he read The Guardian. So that's, how the, fo that's the footballing world, eh? But Andy Gorham came out and um, admitted to being schizophrenic, which meant for the rest of his career, he used to go to games and he would have 20,000 people chanting, there's only two Andy Gorhams. <laughs> and I was thinking about that. The other thing is, like, imagine if you're paranoid. Yeah? Imagine if you're paranoid, the one thing you don't want 20,000 people chanting at you is 1-0 down and it's all your fault, 1-0 down and it's all your fault. <laughs> or if you're paranoid schizophrenic, right, do you want 20,000 people chanting the words, where the voice is in your head? <laughs> you probably don't, do you? Or, of course, if you've got OCD, do you want 20,000 people asking you whether or not you've left the gas on at home? <laughs> Actually, though, it's not just people who suffer from depression. Uh, there are animals, believe it or not, that suffer from depression. For instance, I went to the zoo the other day. Went to see the bipolar bears. Hey! They were fine one minute, next minute they're ripping the fucking heads off the penguins. Brilliant. <laughs> Upsets the children quite a lot, though, I think you'll find. Fucking hell, this is actually starting to taste all right. I must be pissed. 
But last week I'm going to talk to you last week about the one thing that annoys me a lot about being a depressed